Okay, so I am going to show you how to implement matrix multiplication using a sum of vector outer products. And that what I'm talking about will become clearer as we proceed. So at the left here is one matrix and above um, and to the right is the second matrix. So this is the way I like to draw matrix matrices when I'm doing matrix multiplication. So the, there's one input matrix here, a second input matrix here, and an output matrix. These other boxes here we'll come to later. First of all, we're just going to do an ordinary matrix multiplication of these two matrices. So it's kind of standard practice to label the number of rows in one of the matrices as M and the number of columns in the other matrix is N. And the number of shared elements in this inner dimension is K. So the output matrix will have M rows and N columns, in this case, two rows and three columns. Now, the way, the way that matrix multiplication is done is that we take one row of the input, which is a vector of size k, and we do a dot, um, a dot product with the corresponding column of the other matrix, which is another vector of size k. So this is why these two dimensions have to match, because you can't do a dot product if they're not the same size. So to calculate this value, we take uh, actually, so um, so this row and this column produce this cell, this element. So now we can we can say this is equal to this one um, times this one plus this one times this one plus this one times this one, you get 30. So that's the dot product of this row with this column. So now we can go through and do that calculation for each of these output cells. I'll quickly do that. This one is this one times this one plus this one times this one plus this one times this one. And they're on the second row of the output matrix. And so we're on the second row of this input matrix. Now it's good to just go through and do this because you can see the process of the operation. You can see in detail what needs to be done to do this calculation. You can see the iteration that happens. It might seem kind of laborious to go through this. But by doing this, you actually get a sense, get a feeling for what's happening. And by doing that, you actually can think about ways of um, optimizing this or ways of implementing this efficiently. So that's the results matrix. Now, you can see that in terms of accessing elements, um, if you could somehow load elements in and store them and not have to refetch them from wherever you're getting them from, you can see that um, there's kind of, uh, you kind of need to fetch one matrix in and then another matrix in and write a matrix out. So one side of one of these matrices is um, on the order of, let's call it N, a little lowercase n. And so you have to basically um, fetch or read or write n squared elements, um, lowercase n squared elements. So you can ignore the constant of three and you can basically say that the amount of um, 
the kind of memory bandwidth or um, memory usage is of the order n squared. So for matrix multiplication, the memory accesses are n squared, assuming that you're not having to refetch. Now, when we were actually doing this, you can see that we were having to, um, so for this row of this matrix, we went through every single column of this matrix. And then on this row, we had to go through all these columns again. So what that means is that if you don't actually store this matrix in memory or in some kind of local storage space close to where you're doing the calculations, then you have to refetch it. And in, in that case, the actual amount of memory bandwidth is, is much higher than, than ON squared. It's more like, um, I believe it's more like ON cubed. Now, the other thing to notice is that you could actually calculate this the other way around. Instead of going through each row of this matrix, and for each row, iterating through all the columns, you could go through each you could go through each column of this matrix, and for each column, iterate through each row of this matrix. So we could have said, uh, let's do the dot product between this vector and this vector to get this value, and then this vector and this vector to get this value, and then we could have iterated through. So in that case, it would be the other way around. We would only visit each of these once as we went through it, and we would obviously reuse them, but we would only be storing a very small amount locally, and then we would have to go through this whole matrix again every time. So now in terms of the amount of compute that's required, um, we have to do a dot product of two vectors, which are uh, lowercase n size roughly, you know, whether it's m, n, or k, they're all um, a, an array dimension, which means that um, we had to do essentially lowercase n operations to generate each output value. And then we have to do um, essentially n squared of those because this uh, this is a square matrix. So that means n times n squared is n cubed. So the compute requirement is n cubed. It's on the order of n cubed. Okay. So now, this is the next thing I want to show you is what um, I spent quite a while trying to understand it at one point, and I really wanted to explain it because I never, I could never find anywhere on the internet that really explained this clearly, and I thought it'd be useful to share it. So, <clears throat> an alternative way of calculating this matrix multiplication is to use something called vector outer product. And by doing this, what we can do is we can avoid um, revisiting all of either of these two matrices multiple times. And in fact, instead, we can revisit the output matrix multiple times. So the way we do that is we can move through this matrix like this, and we can move through this matrix like this. And we only have to move through this matrix once and this matrix once. And as we're doing that, we create multiple partial, wait, what was the thing I called it? Partial products, partial results. Um, multi multiple outer products. Okay. So, there's three outer products because there are three in a dimension. This inner dimension is size three. So the way we do an outer, the outer product, so the first thing we do is take uh, one column of this matrix. I'm going to highlight it to make it clear what's happening. And one row of this matrix. And so these two rows will generate these two rows. And these three columns will generate these three columns. So this, this outer product matrix here you know, ideally it would be actually placed here as I was showing you. Um, this is the location where the output of calculation of matrix multiplication belongs. It's just that I didn't want to, I couldn't put it there because we already have the normal matrix multiplication result. So I'm going to calculate it over here. So what we can do is we can do an outer uh, vector outer product between these two vectors and it produces an output um, with size m by n. And this is how it's done. So we take this value 
and multiply it by this value. And this gives you the entry here. Oh. All right. This one times this one. Okay. And then again, this value times this one. And then this value times this one. So what we have is this first value in this first row times each of these to produce this new row. And then the second row is this value times each of those uh, values in the second matrix. So that one times that. And that one times that one. And that one times that one. So this is... Um, these are the contributions to the output matrix, to this out, total output matrix. These are the contributions that come from just this row in the, in the second matrix and just this column in the first matrix. Now, when we were doing the calculation before, you can see that the way this, so this, this row would normally be dot, a dot product with this column. So these two would multiply together and this row would normally be a dot product with this column. So these two would go together. So this is just calculating a partial result if we're only handling one column of this matrix and one row of this matrix. So now we can go to the next and generate the next partial result. So I'm going to remove these highlights and we'll go on to the next one. So let's look at the next part is this middle one, the middle column and the middle row. So these two values will contribute to these two rows. And these three values will contribute to these three columns. So we need to now go through those combinations. So this is this one times this one. This is this one times this one. And this is this one times this one. Okay, next row. This is this one times this one. This is this one times this one. And this is this one times this one. So now we have two outer products. And we still need to do one more. So let's just quickly do that last one. Get rid of that. Get rid of that. Okay, so now we're doing this last one. This one and this one. Okay, so this value is this one times this one. This one is this one times this one. This one is this one times this one. It seems really monotonous, but doing this kind of stuff is really good because now we're going to, this, to the next row. It's really good because it really gives you a feeling for what's happening. And that's that one. If I don't mess it up. And then the last one. This one times this one. So now the actual result, the final result, is to sum these together. So this element is this one plus this one plus this one. It's correct. It's the same as this result here. This one is this one plus this one plus this one. That's correct. Same as that value. Okay, next one is this one plus this one plus this one. Same as this value. By the way, I'm just going to remove these quickly. Okay, next row. This is this one partial result plus this partial result plus this partial result. 56, the same. This one is this partial result plus this partial result plus this partial result. 81, the same. And this one is this partial result plus this one plus this one. There was a problem. Okay. 96, okay. <clears throat> so, 
why, why would you want to do this? Well, this gives you flexibility because you can either visit all of um, this matrix. You can do a matrix multiplication where you either visit this first matrix multiple times while you're doing the calculation, or you can visit this second matrix multiple times while you're doing the calculation, or you can visit this output matrix multiple times during the calculation. In this case, we visit it three times. We visit the whole matrix three times. The number of times you visit the output matrix when you're doing the vector outer products uh, approach is K. Um, when you're revisiting this matrix multiple times, um, you have to visit it M times because you, for every row in here, you have to go through the whole of this matrix. And if you're visiting this matrix multiple times, then you have to do it n times because you have to go through this whole matrix for every column of this output. So it gives you this flexibility to choose. Now, why would you want to choose? So if you have some kind of local cache near to your compute unit, whether that's your CPU or somewhere on your GPU, if you're writing some CUDA code and you want to um, do the matrix multiplication as quickly as possible without having to go and refetch data from memory or reaccess memory, <clears throat> you can decide. You can decide based on the size of the matrices. You can find which of these three matrices is going to be the smallest. And then you can um, you can choose the, one of those three approaches based on which one's the smallest. Um, an example of where you have really, really big input matrices and you have a very, very small output matrix is in deep learning where you have uh, back propagation into a, a convolution kernel. So you may have a tiny little convolution kernel of say three by three elements. That's nine elements. And you have nine elements in it. So these matrices may contain um, enormous uh, images essentially of or image size matrices with multiple um, uh, with, a, with an enormous batch size as well. So this, so there may be thousands of elements in this matrix and thousands of elements in this matrix. There may only be nine elements in this matrix. So um, this enables you to only have to visit and load in the data from these two matrices once as you're iterating through them and then be able to locally calculate and store these values. And in fact, if you only have nine values, you could just store them in registers even. Um, if you were, if you wanted to optimize it at that level. So, thanks for watching, and uh, let me know in the comments if you've got any questions or uh, this has been helpful and uh, this has been fun. Thanks for for joining me.